information resources and faster and more reliable technology. Higher performance communication resources and faster and more reliable. Everyone had fun last night. Um, so, bought some lockpicks. Now what? Um, kind of what I hope to accomplish with this talk is. Um, so at a lot of security conferences, you're going to see like lockpick villages or you know lockpicking. It's a related discipline, especially with a physical penetration testing. And what I hope to accomplish with this presentation is how, even if you aren't like a security consultant, you you just do security at your work, your blue team stuff, or even if you're just the IT guy and you wear many hats, I think everyone can benefit from knowing about lockpicking and being familiar with it, as well as like. Um, how it can, you know, make you more aware. Take a look around and see what kind of locks you have at your office. Um, we're going to kind of stick to this agenda, but it's going to be fairly open. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask them, and I'll pretend to be a, able to answer them. Um, so we'll go into intros, explain some stuff, do some disclaimers and legalese stuff. Um, we'll talk about the anatomy of the lock, types of picks, other um, lock manipulation tools, not necessarily picks, but other tools. And uh, we'll do some demos and we'll talk about, after that we'll kind of shift gears and talk about security consulting and ways, um, you know, con concealing locks and lock picks. Sorry, just lock picks. So, yeah. If you haven't yet, um, next door is the lock pick village. Um, that's really awesome. This is the first year I've seen it here at B-Side Salt Lake City. Uh, it's really good. They have some cool demos. You can get familiar with it, um, try a bunch of different locks, and I spent a time over there. It's pretty good. Right after this, they're going to be going over security pins. We're not going to touch that too much here. And then at three, they're going to show you how to make your own Bogota picks, which I'm going to mention here. There's, they're really cool lock picks. So, All right, disclaimer. Um, got some of this from uh, tool.org, or tool.us. That's the open organization of lock pickers. So if you're going to start picking locks, you know, don't pick locks that you don't own or don't have permission to pick, and don't pick a lock that you depend on. So, like, don't pick your front door lock and mess it up so bad that you, your key doesn't work anymore. You know, go, go buy some locks, go to a dollar store, you can get some easy, cheap locks to start with. Um, DI, Habitat for Humanity, you can pick up some. I mean, locks are everywhere. Um, this is for educational purposes, not to be used for criminal or malicious intents, blah, blah, blah. Okay, really quick. Um, it's your responsibility to know if carrying and possessing lock picks in your area is legal. Um, there's several laws about it. Um, Tool has done lots of research for the different states, but you know it's up to you to know your own stuff. And if you want my professional legal advice, I'm not a lawyer and offer none, so don't take anything I say as legal advice. And uh, oh, one thing I did want to mention about this. With all the lock laws that I've read and researched, it seems like it's classified as possession of burglary tools. And the main focus of it is the intent. So just shout out real quick. Other than lock picks, what are some burglary tools? Hammer. Hammer. Yep. Crowbar. What? Crowbar. Crowbar. Yep. Slim Jim. Slim Jim. The, the beef stick or the car thing? The car thing. The car thing. A brick a rock. So technically, if you carry a brick around, you could be carrying a burglary tool, but it all depends. Or what? Mason. Or a mason. Yes, if you're a mason, or a poser mason, and just, you know. But, you know, it comes down to intent. And, you know, here in Utah, I don't expect you to read all of this, but this is the Utah law. Um, basically, it comes down to don't be stupid, don't burgle, don't attempt burglary, stuff like that. So why lock picking in InfoSec? Um, the reason why is, you know, they, they are related disciplines. You know, locks are literally a branch of physical security, one of the ten domains type thing. And, you know, b knowing how to pick locks, you know, especially if you're a security consultant um, doing physical penetration tests, things like that, you can get access to a lot of stuff you shouldn't have access to. Like, you know, unlock terminals, laptops, and routers, network devices, you know. Um, access to internal network. You can plug something in. You know, wiring closets usually aren't monitored. Um, well, I guess it depends where you're at. Um, you could even access a data center. Like, you know, always do this with permission if you do do this in an engagement. Just saying. 
and access to satellite branches or whatever. Um, one thing, so physical security breaches can be as damaging as a computer breach in the sense that, you know, physical access is almost always better because you can just grab a server and walk out and then you can, you know, take it into your own home, pull hashes, you know, get domain information, you know. Um, anyone know the going rate for a laptop on the black market with the data on it? I heard it somewhere, like some people pay like $14,000 if it's connected to like a corporate account and has corporate data just so they can have the data off your laptop. I thought that was interesting. I don't have a source on that, but I heard it once. I did read it on the internet and they don't let anyone post stuff on the internet, so. Um, so continued, um, I kind of mentioned this earlier, uh, definitely security consultants, you know, red team, people that are hired for engagements, you know, no lock picking. What about regular IT guys? How often are we in a server room and, you know, if our server racks are locked and you don't have the keys or like, you know, Bob the network guy is on vacation and the keys to whatever is on his keychain. Maybe you need it. Maybe you have permission to get into that. Um, don't expect you to read all of this, but it's, it's interesting how companies will invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in the latest next-gen firewall equipment, you know, all this different stuff, and then they will protect it with cabinets locked with just dollar, just like cheap hardware store locks, and even basic rooms, like basic door locks, like, well, we're supposed to lock the server room, so uh, here's this uh, generic brand thing locking our server room. Kind of dumb. This is a study done by uh, some pen testers. Uh, have this Anyway, they found that more than 50% of the cases, neither server rooms nor the racks were even locked. Probably for convenience. It's just, I don't want to have to unlock this every time I'm doing maintenance on it. And uh, they also do a lot of uh, stuff for Latin America, and they say Latin America is f ahead and far advanced when it comes to physical security around S&P markets and stuff like that. And uh, they're not as many breaches as in other countries due to the physical security that they have. So, you know, understanding that, take a look around your organization, think about your server rooms, like how important is your corporate data and how are you protecting it, not only like, you know, a network and everything, but physically, how are you protecting that stuff? <coughs> so, kind of summing up, um, physical security is something that everybody deals with. Um, but just by a show of hands, how many people's job is the security at your company? Okay, I would argue that everyone's job is security in one way or another. Like, if you see something, say something type stuff. And, you know, especially, like, we need to, you know, due diligence, say like, hey, that's a really poor lock, that's really dumb. I've got a couple examples here in a second. Um, yeah, but this is just uh, something that uh, Hacks, Hacksonville mentioned at the uh, B-Sides in Orlando. Let's see. And this is from Haikios at Rudicon. He says, no matter what security me measures are implemented, phys when physical access is impossible, or, wow, it's early. No matter what security measures, physical access is still the worst kind of access that you could lose. So, okay, so how effective are locks? Um, I have a good friend of mine, he's a doctor, and he, he does pick locks, and he got hired on, and they were at their, uh, um, their urgent care, their after hours clinic, and you know, they had a medicine cabinet, and their company policy was, you know, prescription and controlled substances, keep it locked in a medicine cabinet, and he was looking at it, you know, it had like Vicodin and Percocet, or you know, who knows what in it, and he's like, and as he was going through, he says, that is a horrible lock, and uh, that is terrible. He's like, oh, well, we have to keep it locked. He's like, let me show you something. He didn't even pull out his lock picks. He pulled out the little Swiss Army knife, keychain Swiss Army knife, and picked it with that and opened it up. And he's like, this is in the patient area. We should really get rid of that cabinet or replace the lock, because that is dumb. You know, just putting a lock there doesn't necessarily deter people. Another example, how many people have something like this at their work where you have a key closet? You know, what, what are the keys inside it to? What, everything. A lot of times they have this in custodial closets because custodians need to go in after hours and clean stuff. You know, what if you get in and access that? What if it's where you keep all your motor pool keys? And, you know, somewhere in your uh, statement of work, if you're doing an on-site, like access to corporate assets, you're like, well, those are corporate-owned cars. I guess I could go park the cars in a big circle in the parking lot, see if anyone notices, because it is, you know. 
But if you look at that, that's protected with just a simple wafer, wafer lock. Very simple, you know. So think about like how you're protecting things. And some people think, hey, if I see a lock, you know, it's going to deter me. It's all on how you implement it. If it's a really dumb lock, or you're just dumb, and you implement it poorly, you know, you're not going to stop some people. Thanks, InfoSec Reactions, for that one. So, why learn lock picking? It's easy. Everyone can learn lock picking. You don't have to have an awesome Linux background and hardcore Emacs, like, you know, you've coded, you know, compile your own distro type stuff. It's like, it's a physical thing. It's like anyone can learn to pick locks. Kids learn to pick locks. Um, it's real easy to get a set of picks. You can even make a set of picks. Um, there's lots of materials you can make them out of. Hacksaw blades, um, street sweeper bristles, the metal from uh, uh, windshield wipers. And you can make your own. It's kind of interesting. And also, locks are everywhere. Um, there's probably locks around your house that you've never used, like on cabinets and stuff. And it's real easy to get locks. Um, you can get them all over the place. You can go to a local locksmith and say, hey, I'm interested. You know, do you have any locks you don't care about? Or locks that you've cut off and don't need anymore? Or, you know, lots of places to get it. Excuse me. So, and another thing, the reason I want people to know lock picking is to understand how vulnerable locks are. To be able to take a look at a lock and be like, that is not a good lock. You know, we should definitely invest the couple hundred dollars or even the hundred dollars to get a better lock to protect the thousands that we're protecting behind it. You know, due diligence, um, you know, it's your job to, you know, speak up and say, you know, speaking from a security standpoint, that should be, you know, better protected. And then, and then if you do have a red team, um, if you go on site and you have a team, you should have at least one physical penetration specialist, proficient in lock picking as well as others. Um, there's like under the door tools and, you know, shimmy and stuff like that. But if you do do engagements like that, you should have at least one person proficient in it. So um, we'll go over this a little bit. I'm going to explain the different parts of a lock. So for those of you that aren't familiar with lock picking, this is how a basic pin tumbler works. Um, the blue pin that you've got on top, that's called the drive pin. And then the red pin on the bottom is the key pin. It's the pin that actually comes in contact with the key. And the key pins are different sizes, and they match the, uh, the correct key. And then um, if you look from the top view, which is what that, this one is, they aren't in a straight line. Like, the holes aren't drilled in a perfectly straight line. They slightly stagger a little bit. And the reason for that is, one, makes it a little harder to pick. Not really. But it also presents a major flaw. So when I show you how to pick in a second, the drive pins will actually catch above, and the key pins will fall free. And once all of the drive pins are set, it'll turn. And then when you insert the correct key, basically what it does, you'll notice the drive pins are different sizes. And the key comes in, and then once they all line up on that line, that's called the shear line, you're able to turn the lock. Basically, what we're going to be doing with picking locks is getting it lined up on that and then turning it without use of the key. So basic types of picks. Um, almost any lock pick set you're going to see is going to have these. Um, first, there's hooks and feelers. This is for single pin picking, where you would go in and pick individual pins, hooks, feeler picks. Um, J hook sometimes. That's the thing. There's lots of different names for picks. So, you know, you can call it at least a relatively understandable name. Um, this is a snake pick or an S rake because it's shaped like an S. And they come in very different variations. Some have like lots of squiggles, some have like a half S and things like that. There's a half diamond, which has a little diamond shape on the end. There's full diamonds and full circles and things like that. Half ball. Um, there's some that have two. They call them a snowman. Anyway, lots of different ones. And then this one is especially for people who do like kind of a raking, scrubbing type pick method. It's called an L rake. Some people call it a saw rake or a comb rake. It's not really a comb rake or a comb pick. That's a different type of pick. But so you know. So you need a lock pick, and you also need a tension tool. Um, any lock pick set you're going to buy is going to come with a tension tool because it's a necessary part. Um, there's a couple different kinds. These are like double-ended ones. Some are shorter, some are longer if you have like a more recessed cylinder. And then these twist flex, they have a 90-degree twist in it. And I actually prefer these over um, 
I prefer these over the straight edge one because if you have a heavy hand, they'll actually bend a little bit more than just a rigid, uh, rigid tension on it. And that's good because you want to be really, really light on uh, how, how much pressure you put. Um, Peterson is a great supplier of lockpick supplies. They have a Peterson pry bar, and what I like about this one is it has a serration on the end, so it doesn't slide out very easily once you have it in the pick. And you can also pick it from the top of the pin, or the top of the cylinder, so you have all that real estate for your pick to go in underneath, whereas most of them you put them in and you're kind of sharing that real estate with your pick and with the tension tool. And I'll show that here in the demo, explaining um, how that works. Um, Bogota picks. So this is what they're going to be doing at the Lockpick Village at 3. But these are basically, the picks can be either a tension wrench or a tension tool or a pick. And they usually fold together. They're really concealable. They're really good picks. If you're only going to carry like the bare minimum of picks, those are some very good ones to carry. Um, let's see. Other non-picks. I'm not really going to go into this too much. Um, for getting into cars, there's these things called auto jigglers. Um, you don't use a tension tool for them. You basically like jiggle it in and out, and you can open most cars. Um, there's pick guns. A lot of people that don't want to take the time to learn, like uh, law enforcement officers, for example, if they just need to get into the door, they'll use these pick guns. And a similar picking method is also bump keys. Bump keys are keys specific to that lock, so like quick set, Schlage, Master, American. But they have, they're cut all the way down, so there's just little bumps, and you basically tap on them, you bump them, and it'll cause the drive pins to jump up, and then you can get in. Um, if there's time, I have a little extra thing to show on that. It works on the same principle as like a line of billiard balls. You hit the ball, and the one on the end pops. So that's how the pick gun and the bump keys would work. Um, there's also shims, like Slim Jims and things like that. Uh, plug spinner is a locksmith tool. Like, if, if you can't pick it, one direction, you pick it the direction that would end up locking it, and then you use a plug spinner to spin it so fast that it goes past the reset point and doesn't reset the pins. And then there's other tools that are non-picks. This is like an under-the-door tool. Um, did anyone attend the uh, physical pen test shop last night, the workshop? Did they go over this at all? I didn't attend it, but... So basically this is, this is something you just stick under the door and uh, you, you have the little cable part. And the ADA compliant lever handles, you can go right under the doors and then, you know, pull it and it'll actually open it and you can open the door from the inside. Yay for uh, compliance. But it's an interesting tool. But those are non-picks. I'm not going to cover those. A um, couple different types of picking. So there's just, you know, you have your hobbyist, like I lock pick, for, you know, I pick locks for fun, you know. Some people consider it an art. It's quite an art form, you know, you it this way. Um, there's also quick and dirty, which, you know, learning that you almost always start out doing like some sort of raking or scrubbing the lock kind of thing. Jiggling is where you're just like shaking it and hope you get lucky sort of thing. Um, brute force, um, not, necess not necessarily a type of picking, but like, you know, some locks you can stick in a screwdriver. These are very cheap locks. Stick in a screwdriver and turn it and it'll like pop the pins or whatever and you can turn the cylinder. Brute force. Um, carding the lock, that would be like a shim or something, you know, come and just card the actual shackle in the door sort of thing. Um, yeah. Covert entry. Um, so this is like highly specialized stuff. Like you're very familiar with the alarm system and you're very familiar with the locks or what they have in place and how to bypass them. And I'm not going to cover that stuff because I don't know much about it. So this is basically a single pin lifting or um, single pin pick, SPP. Um, this is good to start learning. It, the key to lock picking, no pun intended, is really being able to feel inside the lock and because you can't see inside it and being able to feel like, okay, is this one pushing a little harder than the other ones? It's probably a taller pin, you know. And because, if you remember, they don't line up. The holes don't line up in a perfect line. So that's why even though you're picking it above the shear line, it doesn't quite set. It's probably not the one perfectly, you know, offset enough like the other ones are. So you know, you just go through and you try the different ones. And if there's no, nothing pushing back, then you know it's set. Like, you don't feel any spring pushing back. Then once you get them all um, picked, because you have tension on it, it'll twist, and then you've got the lock open. So that's uh, single pin picking. Let's see. And then this is more like raking and scrubbing type stuff. This is where you'd have your different rakes. And, you know, you kind of just shove it in, you kind of get it, and kind of goes. This, this works on a lot of locks. Some of them, like, 
Um, some people will actually like get it in. They will they'll quickly scrub the lock and set like three or four pins or something, and then they'll switch to to like a feeler hook. It, it it's really like what works for you kind of a thing. So, yeah, scrubbing a lock, stuff like that. So, time for a demo. Um, let's go to. You. See, and now I will get this going. Hey, that's my face. OK. So coming down here, I'll show you. Oops. OK. So this is a transparent lock, so you can actually see the individual pins. Oh, I'll hold it up like that. You can see the individual pins. You can't see the key pins very well. And then what you're going to want to do is you'll get your lock pick. Um, this is one that I carry with me every day. This is the um, RCS Tool Company um, jackknife. It's very, very good. Um, you can get it from Southern Specialties. I really, really like this one. Um, it, this locking lever kind of works like the uh, forks on your bike, securing the tire, so it locks it in place. And these picks don't move. They don't wiggle. It's really nice. Uh, standard comes with you know eight different picks. Um, yeah, I really like it. So I'm just going to go do a single pin picking. I'm going to pull out my J hook and then lock it in place. Now you can see this is not going to move. Yeah, it's in there good. Comes with a tension tool. So basically, um, this is what I was talking about earlier. You're putting your um, tension tool inside. It's more ideal sometimes, depending on the lock really, to put it actually up above and then you have all this real estate in here to put your picks. Whereas a lot of times you're going to end up putting your tension tool inside the lock and then you have to share real estate with it. Um, so I'm going to try to do this. Okay. Everyone see that okay? It's upside down, but it's easier to pick that way. So basically, I'm just going in and I'm pushing up individual pins, just like in that uh, animation earlier. And then once you get it, you, like they're all lined up and I felt it kind of move and I just move it the rest of the way and you're in. Does anyone want to see that again? One more time. One more time. Awesome. So actually, this time, let's do it. Instead of doing a single pin pick, let's just do a scrubbing type pick. I will actually use, more often than not, I use an S pick because I learned first by scrubbing. And, you know, single pin pick is good because once you get a better sense of what your fingers are telling you, uh, the inside the lock is. <laughs> But for the, for the most part, you start out with this. So picking it upside down again. But you know, this one, you can just kind of push it in. You can, you know, very similar. You know, put it in, move it in and out kind of thing, get it working. And um, starting out, I suggest you get a, you know, some cheap locks as well as some clear transparent ones. You can get them on Amazon, um, Hacker Warehouse. They sell them. Um, Scam School has some different places. Um, first lock pick I ever had was this Southward jackknife. They don't even make this one anymore. They make a metal one, but I picked probably over 300 different locks of this thing, and it just wore out over time. I've been doing this for about 10 years, and um, similar thing. It's great. It's everyday carry. It's on my keychain. You know, it's great stuff. But sadly, I wore this one out. I loved using it, but let's see. Um, now. I would encourage if you're if you're serious about this, getting a bigger kit, getting some different stuff. This is uh, this is my first big kit I got. It's a South Southord MX MPXS 62. Um, I have some recommendations at the end, and Southord doesn't pay me to say this, but this has lots of different tension tools. You notice how it has uh, lots of different feelers. It has a bunch of different picks like that, and a lot of times you do this long enough, you'll notice that you'll actually start carrying a lot more tension tools. I've given, given a bunch away out of this kit, so I don't have as many, and have a couple different things. And really, it depends on the type of lock. You can become familiar with locks. Some people have gone through and said, you know, with this type of Schlag, we recommend using this sort of lock and things like that. You know, it's a really good kit. I've been pretty happy with it. It's bulky. It's heavy. You know, it's like a very fat wallet. You can get starter kits for, like, 15 bucks, 20 bucks, stuff like that. Um, I 
I sort of stick with my favorites. It's sort of like teaching, your, teaching yourself, you know, piano or something like that. You do what's, what works for you, what you're familiar with. More often than not, I, uh, I use my S pick. I use one of these two feeler picks. I use this one, which is pretty standard. This one's kind of a reach around, pretty curved pick, very slim. Um, and then I use the half diamond quite a bit. So, I, let's see. So the ones I use are the, these. So these are probably the four most common picks that I use. Um, I only use this one kind of like in and out set the picks and then I'll switch and do like the half diamond so I can get like the individual and not bump other pins that are already set kind of thing. But really, you know, Try a bunch of different locks, get proficient. One of the things I like to do, um, I actually have a big set of padlocks that are just locked, you know, onto each other. And then while I'm watching TV, you know, I'll just be sitting and I'll just, you know, not thinking about it, just go through and pick the different locks. It's, it's kind of good because sometimes if you're focusing, you're like really like pushing too hard. And Oh, that's one thing I did want to mention. So tension is like super important. For one, tension, you can feel kind of the different clicks once you set the pins. So I don't know how well we can see this. So that's about how much tension you want. If you're pushing so hard that you can start seeing the blood run out of your finger and it's white, you're pushing way too hard. It's surprising how little you have to push. Um, Iron Geek, Adrian Crenshaw says, think of it like you have a pet ant and you, you, you want to pet that ant that you love so much, but you don't want to squash it. So you're literally pushing that little bit on it. So. If, if you just can't get it, or if you're pushing and like none of the pins are moving, your, your tension is way too, way too hard. Um, a lot of times I'll use my index finger to push. However, if you're starting out, it's a little more awkward, but push with your pinky. If, you're, if you have a heavy hand, push with your pinky. Like, it's so much lighter and easier. Um, there are some, like you pick the other direction, and you know I'm right-handed, so. You know, use your thumb, but then again, your thumb is one of your strongest fingers, and you have to really let up. Something to know. Um, let's see. Switch back over to this. Um, so now let's switch gears for a little second. Um, we have, like, different... So you're going on an engagement, and maybe you're going to a secure facility. Um, they don't let you take cell phones or something like that. There's lots of different covert picks. Um, Rift Recon makes some gentlemen's Bogotas. They're really kind of dapper looking Bogota picks. Um, I got a picture of them on, on the next slide. Um, fake credit cards. I'm sure you've all seen this before. Um, it's a fake looking credit card that is actually a sleeve for lock picks inside it. Um, this, this is a very interesting one. This uh, penetration tester in China, or, um, named Sexy Cyborg, she made shoes for her on site engagement. She's a physical pen tester. And then these gentleman covert picks that I'll talk about in a second. So here's some pictures. So the guy with the lapel, um, probably can't see it too well, but those are two Bogota picks pressed up against each other. And the, he has a little spring from inside a pen and a paper clip, or a safety pin. And you can pin them on your lapel. You can pin them inside your pant leg. So like, you can sneak them in. Lock picks, you can sneak them in a lot of places, especially if they're titanium, because typically titanium won't trip a lot of metal detectors. They're more expensive, titanium. Um, has anyone seen these lockpick cards? Um, they're cool. They're, they're fun to carry around in your wallet. Tool makes a really good one, I'm told. I actually don't have it. Um, that's Kevin Mitnick's business card that he gives out to people. They're, they're great, um, you know, but once you pop them out, they're used. And you can put them on a key ring or whatever. And then that's a picture of the uh, lockpick credit card, which doesn't look fake at all, you know. Card owner is James Bond, expires uh, January 2003. So no one's going to notice that. It is about two to three times thicker than a standard credit card. So it is a little bulky, but then again, it's, it's reusable. Like you pull them out, it's not like you snap them out and you can't snap them back in. You just put it back in the sleeve. So this is a, these are some shoes, some platform wedges. Now, I didn't have a picture of her. She usually wears like a mini skirt t cocktail dress and a very low cut. Um, top, and that's what she does all her engagements on. So she has no pockets, no places to hide, you know, a bulky lockpick set type thing. So um, 
for a lot of her engagements, she actually designed these. She 3D printed them, and um, inside it, she can put her uh, wireless router that she can plug into the network and then access remotely. And then on the other side, she has you know her key logger. She has a little you know extension thing, and then she has a couple set of picks and some tension wrenches, and she also has a uh, padlock shim. I didn't talk about padlock shims at all, but and she. All of her engagements, that's what she brings. She doesn't bring a purse. She, a lot of times she has to check in her cell phone. I mean, you can hide padlocks, in, or wow. You can hide lock picks in your cell phone case, like if you have an external case. I've done that before. So really clever. Um, she goes through and explains how she did it. It was, it was really cool, really inventive. Um, so some of the problems. This is a, that's a picture of one that I have here with me. So this is a lockpick um, card that I got. It's actually a SEER card. It's like a survival, evade, resist, escape card. So it has like some padlock, some uh, handcuff shims and stuff too. Let's get that out of the way. Sorry. And then, you know, it was cool. Tried it out, but the thing is, like, as soon as I popped it out, the first thing I noticed, like, it's very small. But also, the little tabs where I had the uh, where it was connected were really sharp. I didn't like that. I did. And it's a one-time use thing. This, the tension tool was flat, so I actually had to bend it at a right angle to use it. And it came with just you know, your standard filler and rake. I mean, it's cool for in a pinch as like throwaway picks. And that's kind of what they're intended for, one-time one use. Um, so switching back. So some problems that you might come across, that you might be at a facility where you know, there's metal detectors and your steel picks, you can't get them in. You know. Titanium would be great. If anyone can think of a non-metallic material for lockpicks, I'm very interested. Um, carbon fiber at that thickness isn't strong enough. It's almost like a dry twig. A sp like it might work as a pick, but as a tension tool, it'll snap almost immediately. Uh, you know, maybe some kind of you know G10 or like some sort of polymer or something. I don't know. It's a pet project of mine trying to think out. Good picks can take up space. Um, Granted, if you're going to take, if you don't know what you're expecting, you want to be prepared. So you might end up having to take a big, you know, bulgy, you know, lockpick set. I avoid it when you can, but more often than not, have something small, concealable, um, if you can. I actually went to a courthouse, and you know, they caught me for this, and I was like, oh, good, good catch. Um, also, um, lockpicks are approved, are okay with the TSA because it's. Uh, a tool, that a non-bladed tool under seven inches, it's okay to carry on board. You still might get, you know, the, you know, power-hungry TSA agents be like, oh, you can't take that. But anyway, so you know. Um, wallet cards, one-time use, you know, sharp snap-off tabs. Um, granted, I have I have this one. I'm told the tool one is very very nice. I want to get that, and probably doesn't have the tabs as much. Um, how many uh, Mission Impossible fans do we have? The, the TV series. One. Two. So this is from uh, season seven, episode six. This is called Underground. Basically, he's uh, captured, and he's in a room where they take, take his earbud, they take his, you know, empty his wallet, take, take his uh, pockets, his uh, belt, everything. And, you know, he's in there. Luckily, he had his 1970s wide collars, and so he could fit, so he actually fits a full-length pick in it. So for perspective, that's a full length pick and this is my neck. So I mean if you have 1970s collars, you're good. Granted you have the business end of the pick, usually pretty sharp, like inches, centimeters from your juggler. I don't recommend that. But yeah, if you're doing an engagement and you have a 70s collar, go for it. Um, hide in plain sight. You can get these on Etsy right now. Um, they come in pink and fuchsia and a variety of colors, but they're earrings. So if you want to wear circa 1980 shoulder dusters, awesome. You can have some lock picks. Now, if anyone's familiar, and I think you know, a security professional should be at least familiar. Like, if they see something like that, looks like a lock pick. Why are you wearing those? You take those off. You know, maybe you're at a place where they're totally clueless. I don't know, but you can get those on Etsy. They're like 35 bucks. Um, so. This was kind of the thing I was thinking about. I was up late one night thinking, like, how can I make a reusable lockpick that would be cool and, you know, easily concealed, small? And this, this is just something that I was trying out, and I want people's feedback. But 
I came up with these things. I'm calling them gentleman covert picks. The, you know, patent pending, by the way. Uh, got the domain name last night. But anyway, um, these are some lockpick collar stays that I designed a little while ago. Um, they're nice, they're easily concealable. It comes in a set of four and you fold them over each other. And those familiar with collar stays, you know, you fold them like that and they fill out the shape of the collar stay. Um, dapper, classy, it's kind of James Bondish. Span boys would totally heart this. Um, ultra concealable, I mean, even if you don't wear a collared shirt, um, you can hide them in your cell phone case, you can hide them in your wallet. Um, these are steel. Um, if I do mass produce these and market them, they'd be available in titanium as well. Um, so yeah, um, I make them with a CNC machine. I have a machinist that makes them for me, does a pretty good job. And uh, I'm actually wearing them. Ooh, demo time. So yeah, you'll notice they aren't the full length one, so it's not going to stab me in the neck. It's just like, you know, it's a good four inches away. And so I designed these. Let me switch over to this again. So I carry these just because I'm trying them out. I'm, right now I'm just in design testing and stuff like this. So what you get is you get your three picks. This isn't a sales pitch, by the way, but if you are interested, talk to me. Um, I really just want feedback. Like if this is a good design pick, is it practical? I've got a couple sets of them here, so I'll have them over in the lockpick village if you want to try them out. So anyway, it comes with a your half diamond, your snake pick, and your L rake, and then also a tension tool. I went with kind of the hockey shape, hockey stick shape design because if it was a straight 90 degree angle, sometimes this part would get in the way of the lock, and I wanted it kind of angled like that. So, time for demo fail. Um, so, very minimal, you know, Bogotas would probably work better, but this is a fun little pet project. I didn't want to do um, like a straight type tension tool because I didn't want to do something like this um, because I prefer the twist flex because this one has no give whereas this one you know you, you can bend it a bit and you, you have a lot more um, forgiveness I guess you can call it but basically you know very similar and I've tried this on a couple different locks and seems to work fine but you know come in here And if you want to get good at lock picking, do it in front of an audience, by the way, so your nerves can be like totally shot or whatever. And then, you yeah, know, just, oh, oh, oh. So still, still in the design stage, but this is something that I thought, you know, it might be sort of fun. See if there's a market for it at all. Okay, let's try a different one. That's the thing, if you're starting out with lock picking, like sometimes you might be real comfortable with a, with a certain type of pick and it's just, for the life of you, it is just not working with that lock. You should be able to use a bunch of different locks, you know, basically more um, tools to your arsenal. Okay, come on now. These do work, I promise. Did it this morning before I got in front of people. Oh, stop it. Maybe, yeah. This is why we don't mic the audience. Let's try a little better. Again, still in demo stage, by the way, but... Can you guys still see what I'm doing? I'm not even... Great. Oh, I just picked it and it popped out. Embarrassing. Anyway. Uh, you get the gist. Um, so, still, these are prototypes. This is still something I'm still designing. I'm still, you know, I'm interested in people's feedback. This is something that, you know, you could, I don't know, Bogota picks are nice. These are, you know, dapper, classy, whatever you want to call it, but, so. Hey, it does work. All right, everyone take a drink. So anyway, that's a little pet project I was doing. Um, if you're interested, you can talk to me afterwards about it. I'm still designing it. Okay, um, recommendations. Um, how many of you do have lock picks? Just by show of hands. Maybe about half. How many are kind of interested, gonna look into it after this talk? Yes, 
they accomplished something. A um, couple different sets. Um, Southward makes some really nice picks. The PXS 14 it has it's a 14 piece lock pick thing. It's it's a lot slimmer. I think I saw one at the village yesterday. Um, if you're going to have an everyday carry type pick, I highly highly recommend this one from Southern Specialties. The uh, this folding knife. Um, yeah, they call them jack knives. I really like it. And when you order it, you can actually pick which um, picks you want in it. So if you want Euro style or things like that, um, I recommend this one because I own it. I'm, you know, it's it's nice. It has a lot of stuff. It has both um, thick handled, which are more comfortable, as well as just the uh, thin. Uh, I think they call them thin lines picks as well. Peterson Pry Bar. Um, I'm pretty active on the uh, lock picking subreddit they rave about this thing I mean it doesn't slide out very easily I've actually thought of integrating it into mine but it's it's a really good pick oh, you want me to go back for that okay um, recommendations so these are some great websites where you can get more information about it um, tool is probably one of the best uh, open organization of lock pickers um, lock wiki Schuler town South Lord is a supplier um, Southward, they are better quality locks. Sometimes when you're looking at locks, you might notice that it looks like they just took a hacksaw blade and they kind of cut it out and there's sort of serrations on the top. And what you want is like a really smooth one that's smoothly cut out. Something to look for when you're looking at lock picks. Um, Southward also has a clearance section, so um, scratched or blemished picks, you can get them at a discount because you're going to stick them in a metal lock anyway and scratch them, so whatever. Uh, the subreddit's really good. Also, um, two guys that I follow pretty closely, um, Iron Geek and Deviant Olam, they have some cool um, lock picking videos. Deviant teaches that Black Hat, Iron Geek puts up all the bunch of security conference videos and he's really into lock picking. I actually sent him a set. He, he and I have been uh, communicating. Um, so that's all I had. Does anyone have any questions? I think we got 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Yeah, Thomas. Mm -hmm. Do you mean like like the padlocks, like the uh, have the different dials type things, or do you mean like the actual dial lock on a safe? No, just, uh, it would have four tumblers with numbers on. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. So he's talking about uh, are the combination locks more secure? And the answer is it depends. Um, there's a master lock right now that has it's got the ten, it's got the four pins, and it has the ten digit numbers on them, or you roll them and then you pop it open. That actually has a bypass flaw in it. So I didn't talk about bypass tools. Those are basically like picks that you would put like along the number tumblers, for example. You can actually reach and flip the, uh, or like catch the release lever and pop it open. Um, that master lock one has a, is a known vulnerability. Actually, um, on my, this tool, or on my lockpick card. So on this, um, this is a handcuff shim, but you notice how it's a point. I wouldn't take this on a plane, by the way, because they could argue that that's a blade. I would take this, but this is, can also function as a bypass tool. It's very thin, and you can actually put it between those tumblers and go in and disengage the catch release. So, um, something to consider. Uh, yeah, it really just depends. There's some that are great secure, there are some that are not secure at all. But any other questions? So the question was what's a good lock? And actually here in the extra section, um, this is Deviant Olam's list. Um, this is what he uh, said he recommends. These are different um, locks. Uh, Scorpion, get a Schlage Primus. Um, they have a Instead of the, they have the regular tumbler pins, but they also have a security pin in it. Um, I'm not covering that, but at 11 they are. Um, Albus, um, basically any kind of, uh, they're called SFIC or SFIC. Um, it's a small format interchangeable cylinder. They're all good locks. Um, Mr. Locksmith, he has a lock, he's a locksmith based in Canada. He has a pretty active YouTube channel. But he says the Abloy Protect 2 high security deadbolt is the best lock you can buy for deadbolt. He's, 
It's pick resistant. He argues it's pick proof. The reason why, it's been out for like a year or so now. There are no known vulnerabilities. There are lots of people trying to pick that and no one has been able to. He puts it on his. He, he says it's unpickable until someone has done it, but no one's been able to do it. So if you have 175 bucks, do that. Medcos are good. So I don't have any slides of that, but if you look at a Medco key, you'll notice that a lot of keys, like, they're just cut straight on, so you put the key in and it's cut straight on. Medco keys, they actually make the cuts like this. The reason why is the pin hole, instead of like a circle like this, it's actually flattened, and the pin has to be twisted a certain direction before it'll go up. Medco keys are really nice. Like, they're, they're a bugger to pick. So, um, yeah, those are some that they recommend. I haven't tested them all out, but they have, so hopefully that helps. Any other questions? Cool. I do have a, I did mention uh, auto jigglers. I do have a set of those up here, or somewhere. But, so you'll notice this isn't a tension tool type thing. You literally put it in and you just kind of jiggle it. And most car automotive locks are a double-sided wafer lock, which is similar to a pin tumbler lock, but a lot weaker. And you can see how easy it is to get in. It really depends, and you just kind of you pull it in and out, up and down, and you twist it slightly. They're that easy to use. Um, downside is you can't really, most cars are chipped. You can't really steal a car, but you could get into a car. You could get the registration info and find out where people live. You could do all sorts of creepy stuff. Um, I did mention bump keys. This is just a little image of how bump keys work. I have a setup here. Um, bump keys are cool. Those that consider art pick, or lock picking an art, Kind of, you know, th they're like, this isn't picking. This is just burglar manipulation, like lock manipulation stuff. Um, anyone can do this. The downside to this, if you're trying to sneak into a house, you're literally knocking on the door you're trying to sneak into. It's very loud. You know, you get a screwdriver handle, or they even have special, like, mallet sort of things. So, you know, there are bump keys. Interesting stuff, but, um, yeah. Oh, that was a picture of a cell phone I used to have, but I used to carry those with me. And I just used the S-Rake, but yeah. If there's not any other questions, that's all I had. Um, yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs>